You're listening to the Global Ooj Podcast, where every week we learn about the world through the eyes of entrepreneurship. With your host, Ujwal Velagapudi. Welcome to the very first episode of the Global Ooj Podcast. I'm so excited to be sharing with you all our very first guest on the show, Kelvin Teo. Kelvin was born in Malaysia, moved to Singapore later in his teenage years, and eventually got his MBA from the Harvard School of Business. He started his company, Funding Societies, with a fellow classmate while still in school at Harvard. Investors had even asked how much it would take in funding to have them drop out of school and work on their startup full time. To date, Funding Societies has raised well in excess of $60 million from prominent firms like Sequoia Capital and SoftBank Ventures. Kelvin has been selected as one of the top fintech influencers in all of Asia. Funding Societies is headquartered in Singapore with operations in Indonesia and Malaysia, and they're slowly expanding across all of Southeast Asia. I think you'll really like this conversation. Enjoy. Welcome to the show, Kelvin. How are you? Hi, Ushwal. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be uh, on the show here. Thank you. And so for the audience, could you tell a little bit more about what Funding Societies is, where you guys are based out of, and how exactly you guys are helping the Southeast Asian market? Sure. So Funding Societies is the largest uh, and the number one F SME fintech lender in Southeast Asia. Uh, we we exist to really serve a short-term fi financing need that SMEs typically have um, because banks are structurally set up to serve more on the consumer as well as corporate banking side. So we really exist to, to help SMEs with their working capital short-term financing needs. And this range from term loan to trade finance to micro loans like, e like uh, merchants on the e-commerce. And these loans are typically funded by both individuals and institutions in the form of crowdfunding and balance sheet. At, at launch in June 2015, we've given out slightly more than 1 billion US dollars of loans across the region to close to 51,000 SMEs um, in, 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 uh, in, in this region. So, so we are very fortunate there to be among the, the, the pioneers in the region, uh, enjoying the high side benefit from US U in other regions like US, Europe, uh, China, and India. And that currently we're the only player that is licensed in Singapore. Indonesia as well as Malaysia uh, with the goal of, of uh, entering into Thailand, Philippines and Vietnam in the next 24 months. I think we are very fortunate to be uh, to, to receive backing from uh, from Sequoia as well as SoftBank and our goal, our vision next is to really uh, not just focus on SME financing but really evolve the business to help SMEs end to end in all stages of their growth in two ways. Firstly, is to really continuously build up our software as a service offering, which is something that we've been building and investing in in the last few years, as well as securing our wholesale digital bank license, starting from Singapore, but hopefully in the next, in another one or two more countries in Southeast Asia, so that we can serve, uh, serve SMEs banking needs and really act as an alternative bank for the SMEs in Southeast Asia. So I think as a quick personal background, um, I'm Malaysian who was, who was very, very fortunate to receive a scholarship to study in Singapore for my uh, O-levels as well as subsequently undergrads. Um, started my career with Accenture before moving on to McKinsey, uh, where I did a bank operations transformation. Finally, KKR Capstone, Harvard Business School, and then Funding Societies. Wow. Wow. That's, a, that's pretty amazing, Calvin. Thanks for the detailed background. I mean, you hit on so many different things that want to jump into you had starting off the top you had mentioned that it is crowdfunded i mean it is a p2p network so let's just say you know me as a us based investor how would that work exactly um you know there's i'm not i'm not very bullish on the us stock market as of today so uh i want to invest in in um in some projects within funding society so how can you walk me through that process of I've got X number of dollars, how would that go through your platform and help out one of the SMEs? Sure, sounds good. Uh, but just for, to, to also clarify, we started off as a peer to business lending platform, but I think after studying the markets in overseas, we have actually actively diversified our funding sources um, because to include both individuals, accredited investors, as well as institutions, um, both on balance sheet lending basis as well as crowdfunding basis. And 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 this is because we, we believe that is a peer to peer, peer to business lending is a great place to start. It's a terrible place to end. And that's why in the last few years we've been actively evolving. 
I'm going to talk about this a bit more later. But I think from, from individual investors, we do accept individual investors globally, um, as long as you can pass through the KYC uh, process. And that whole, and basically to open an account, you can simply just go to our website, fundingsocieties.com, whereby uh, by submitting two basic information, basically source of, uh, uh, source of wealth as well as uh, your, your identification information will be able to onboard you. Um, and that by depositing your money into our escrow account, which is held by a third party license operator in a bank, uh, separately in a bank, you'll be able to start investing. And we, and we, the, and because we want to enable more people to access this form of alternative investment, which really differentiates itself from the other uh, investment classes by being liquid, by being simple. Um, by by having relatively short uh, locking period because all of our loans are below twelve months, and we have deliberately set the minimum investments to be approximately twenty dollars Singapore twenty Singapore dollars or approximately fifteen one five U S dollars so that you can investors can really actively diversify their investment uh, portfolio. So after opening an account, there are really two ways to invest. We started off with with the opportunity for investors to pick the specific loans that they want to invest in. Um, but what we realize, and typically we will send out a fact sheet approximately a few hours ahead of uh, our, our funding period so that investors can study the fact sheet and make an educated decision. But what we also realize is that people with money oftentimes don't have time. So what we have what we have done is to pioneer with this whole uh, a new investment approach called auto investments, whereby by giving us a standing instructions of the loans that you'd like to invest in, uh, upon a loan that satisfies your requirement, we will automatically allocate your funds to the specific to each of these loans, so that it it increases the chance of investors creating a diversified portfolio. So 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 far we are very we are very proud and fortunate that a lot uh, that investors have been making very competitive returns relative to the to the local market. Uh, other options in the local market, but also one thing to highlight is that a common myth investing in peer to peer peer to business lending is that hey, you earn double digit returns, you you become very rich from that. That's not where our value proposition is. Our value proposition is to really help investors to access a convenient liquid fixed income, so that you receive monthly repayments, so that the, the investment is locked in for less than twelve months. Um, but we do not uh, we do not uh, generate double digit or high returns to investors because if I generate double digit returns to you, if I make you really rich, I need to make some the SMEs really poor. So for us, using Singapore as a market for reference, the typical uh, returns that you receive after invest after service fee and after defaults is typically mid single digits to high single digits. And comparing to the the inflation rate as well as fixed deposit rate of zero point five percent in Singapore, that's actually a pretty good return to uh, to pr protect your wealth to preserve your wealth. Yeah, that's pretty good for the U.S. market as well. <laughs> I mean, especially what we can get at a traditional bank. So. I mean, I've, I've uh, especially in the past few months, I've looked to invest in various platforms, various locations. Uh, some of the main things that myself or any other investor would worry about is that default rate, which you had mentioned, which uh, was just under 3%, right? So could you go a little bit more into that? And then also the collateral, uh, or are these unsecured loans to, to the SMEs? And uh, so how does that work? Uh, on the origination or on the underwriting side, and then also the default. Sure. So our focus on on underwriting is really in terms of cash flow as well as product structuring, right? So I think how we differentiate from banks is that banks focus on big, long secured loans, big long secured loans, typically long for with a tenure of three to five years secured, usually because that it comes with a collateral because it's very hard for a bank to predict the ability to repay of SME three to five years forward. So they almost always ask for collateral. And big is typically the loan sizes are a bit, uh, above a million, two million dollars, if not, it's not so interesting to the banks. And that's why even even now, uh, up to now, majority of the SME loans, if it's unsecured, is backed by a government resharing program. If not, even for local banks, even in the developed market like Singapore, will probably be not as interested in terms of unsecured financing for SMEs. For us, we really specialize in small, short unsecured financing, small to cleave with a loan with a loan size of less than a million dollars, averaging about one hundred fifty thousand USD in the case of Singapore. Tenure wise, less than twelve months, typically six to nine months. Um, Typically unsecured in terms of uh, of 
of collateral. So all we we do ask for personal guarantees, but the focus for us is to is to really by using data analytics as well as product structuring to predict ability to the cash flow in the next few months rather than using collateral as a way to manage risk. The interest rates are typically higher than than bank rates because we do not ours is an investment product, not a deposit product. Our cost of fund is not as low as what banks can can get. Um, hence the interest rates are higher than banks, but typically lower than credit cards. Because for us, the goal, our vision is really to serve uh, short-term financing needs of the SMEs, um, and not just pro- profiteering from from from, S- from SMEs. So in terms of other overall underwriting process, we really focus split by there are really three key approaches where might be underwrite, and all of this is we start by thinking from first principle perspective, which is really ability and willingness to repay, right? Um, but using different ways to assess it uh, compared to banks. I think the three broad way approaches that we underwrite is number one, taking a more app-based big data approach, whereby following what Cabbage uh, is doing. We basically pull various data sources in a market that's perhaps more mature, like Singapore or to an extent Malaysia, pass through our enti- uh, digitalized information and then run, run it through our data uh, uh, algorithm, uh, which has been trained since 2016 and, and continuously refined, and it's also and which we have also found to be to actually been approving more at a higher rate at a higher quantum, uh, and yet generate the same percentage defaults as our human underwriters when we first start uh, after training for a few for a few years. So it's really taking a more big data app based approach uh, as a first way. The second way is really using a digital ecosystem approach, whereby by working with um, various B two B platforms, including e commerce merchant, e commerce pl- uh, platforms, we augment um, traditional data or the limited traditional data with digital transaction information and reviews information. We have also in the process created our own supply chain finance platform, similar to what GreenSale is doing, whereby we can onboard and uh, by onboarding anchors, the anchors will in turn onboard the distributors and suppliers, whereby we can get more uh, get digital transaction information to manage the risk of the SMEs. And then the third way is really cash flow based information, whereby we do digitalize information um, and try to op- automate back end operations, there is still a human element to, to over underwriting. But by digitalizing human intuition, we try to combine both digital scorecard, uh, which is driven statistically, as well as human intuition, um, and to come up with a combined score to serve these SMEs, whereby the loan quantum could be bigger than what other applicants may be applying for. So from a lot of what you had said throughout this entire process, throughout the underwriting process, there's a lot of technology being utilized um, from end to end, right? So was that one of your biggest um, biggest core competencies? Was it truly the technology versus the actual business model, especially when you had started? Because uh, this, you know, the lending aspect, that's, that's an archaic, I mean, it, it's been around for thousands of years, right? The actual lending, but is it truly the technology and how you are able to connect both parties to facilitate that credit, what sets you apart from from your competitors? I think fundamentally our our value proposition to the SMEs is really access to financial uh, to, to financing. So that's the first and foremost value proposition, right? SMEs that can't get financing at all or they, they are bankable, they have uh, bank financing, but they're not getting sufficient finan- uh, sufficient loan because um, they do not have sufficient collateral. So first and foremost, financial access is the first, uh, first pain point, followed by speed and then flexibility. Uh, but financial access is first and foremost the key the key gap that we're currently facing. And I think based on World Bank IFC's estimate across the six key economies in Southeast Asia, the financing gap for SMEs total to a pro- excuse me, Total to approximately 320 billion US dollars a year, uh, which is sizable. But I think the common myth is also that in some, it, that um, to solve a- any of these uh, business problems, technology is the is a, is a sole solution, um, which is not the case. I think in Southeast Asia, we have seen play players. I think in taking a continuum, we have seen players that are trying to solve all problems using technology, especially in, and in an area like fintech, it actually results in very high defaults very quickly because the reality is that in Southeast Asia, there isn't sufficient digitalized information, especially in the space of SMEs. I think when it comes to consumer, uh, consumer financing, consumer fintech, that approach may work, be- may, may, may work pretty well, but when it comes to SMEs, solely relying on technology is not going to solve the problem. But we have also seen on the other end 
of the of the continuum whereby it's very similar to what the banks are doing, and then what they do is they just drop the interest rates or by a bit um, and compete compete uh, by price, which is uh, a not sustainable, um, and b uh, not pro- frankly it's not sustainable from an overall pricing perspective, but it's not profitable as an organization over time, and you end up a situation like what you've seen in in other markets like US and Europe, whereby. Um, a lot of fintech credit players have not been successful in turning profitable even after 10 years in, in business. I think where we see, where our approach is really to take a, is to really take a balance, a balance uh, attitude, which is to really combine both fin and tech together. Um, uh, we do recognize that when it comes to SMEs, you can't automate everything all the, uh, at, uh, at, at the onset, it really has to be a progressive approach. So the reality is that we, when we first started off, it was a lot more thin than tech, a lot of product structuring, a lot of um, insights of human, human-driven human expertise in terms of underwriting and risk management. But I think in the last five years, we've been very fortunate to continuously experiment various methods and then implement tech in solving two ways. One is to really reduce, actually three ways. One is to really reduce our costs of uh, operations when it comes to credit assessment. There are some things that you do need humans to manage it. But number two is really to improve our our credit underwriting to be to take smart risks, not higher risk in terms of in terms of reducing human biases in terms of incorporating uh, data analytics towards underwriting and risk assessment um, and of course i beyond that i think data analytics is so applied in another another area which is sales analytics so the question is it's not just how do we uh, is is it's easy to give up money but the question is how to give up to money, money to the folks that who actually rightfully uh uh, deserve of it. So hence sales analytics to give out money and then credit analytics to take back money. Hmm. And so throughout the past five years, when you had started, I'm sure there was a lot of, um, there were, a, there was a lot of kickback or a lot of pushback, uh, and push down from a lot of the big players, right? Especially in 2015, 2016, your early days. So can you talk about what that looked like, especially when some of the banks are feeling the pressure from funding societies and saying, you know what, we're going to, you know, uh, I mean, if it could be either with how they operate their business or anything on on the back end where they're saying, you know, they're pushing out some legislation that uh, tries to push out players like you guys, did you face any of that? So I think um, from a banking competition perspective, the reality is that the, the banks do I think in public relations, when it comes to press release, um, there may be a stance of, hey, we welcome fintechs and so forth. But in reality, when it comes to collaboration, sometimes it's a bit um, lacking, especially in the early years. And, and frankly, that's not to the fault of their banks, right? The reality is that when we first started out in 2015, 2016, there wasn't that much a fintech like, ours can, like us can offer because we are starting out to build our capabilities, right? But I think we are very fortunate in two ways that, number one, um, because we are fundamentally complementing banks, not competing with banks, um, despite the initial biases or potential sense of threat that the banks may feel, we are fundamentally complementing banks, and that's why we are very fortunate that in we are at least in one mar- in every single market we are partnering with at least one bank, if not two banks, in, to serve the SMEs' needs. Because eventually they did realize that we are more complementary than competitive compared to banks. Uh, compared to because of our target segment and per, compared to our product offering, so one example is that I think in twenty sixteen we are the very first uh, fintech credit player to have partner with a bank, um, and in that case was DBS Bank in twenty sixteen. Apparently, it was a huge deal in Southeast Asia. It was reported in Bloomberg and translated into X, I think ten, uh, ten plus languages, and it was one of the trending article at that point in time. Um, and and that was a starting point. And ever since then, we have been actually working quite a bit with banks, including. Um, we see in our recent series, see um, one of the biggest Indonesian banks became our shareholder because we find that in the early days, we can't take bank money because if we partner, we take money from one bank, another bank will not partner with us anymore. But now we have reached a scale because we're the biggest player in Southeast Asia, likely around three times the size of our closest competitor. We feel confident that even if we take money from one bank, um, the other banks will still be willing to work with us because of our capabilities. But I think from a regulation perspective, um, one thing that I think really differentiates Southeast Asia perhaps compared to many other parts of the world is that 
the regulators have really enjoyed the high side benefit from from the mid the, the lessons and mid and mistakes that other other parts of the world has made. And for example, in 2016, the regulators in Southeast Asia has preemptively started setting up regulations after they saw how it how the market blew up in China. Um, so and that has created and they have done it in a very consultative approach whereby we're very fortunate to to be leading quite a few industry committees in Southeast Asia right, for the in the, uh and, and engage with the regulators ahead of time, which has enabled uh the region to create actually one of in our view, one of the most conducive uh fintech regulations uh in the world. And that's really cr- and enabled for for industry like fintech, which is re- whose fate is very much closely related to the regulations, it's actually created a very sustainable and healthy industry um, uh, that, that has enabled a lot of fintech players to, to grow in a sustainable way. And it's not about, hey, I want a ton of num- of fintech players to exist in the space. No, that's not the case. But rather, how can we have a right number of players to grow in a sustainable way such that it serves not just uh, the needs of the SMEs or the needs of the society and economy, but also it allows the, the players to grow, it to, to flourish. And one thing that we're very fortunate is that um, with the recent COVID-19, um, it has really accelerated the collaboration between fintech and the governments. So previously, fintech is considered an alternative form of financing, but, government, but through COVID, government institutions like, say, in Malaysia, they started co-lending with fintech players. So every two, and, and that, and following the trend that you've seen in US and, U, and, and UK, which previously was probably unheard of, and impossible or unlikely, right? Um, so in the case of Malaysia, the government has set up a fund called My, My Co-Investment Fund, whereby for every $2 that we lend to an SME, they will co-lend $1 with us. I think that's, that was really, really helpful. Similarly, in recent times, the, the government has created, um, in Singapore and soon Malaysia, has created uh, a path um, for a digital bank license whereby non-bank players like fintech fintech players like ourselves would have a path towards getting a digital bank license which has which would really help us to serve the SMEs better but uh, but also expand the scope that we can serve because with that we'll be able to take deposits um, and that reduces our cost of fund and therefore which we can actually pass on to the SMEs so i think overall we're very fortunate that in Southeast Asia the, both the competition level from banks as well as regulations has been a lot more conducive compared to say in other parts of the market, which I think based on the whole research by BIS quarterly review, are one of the other two key factors that contribute to the success and or failure of a fintech credit market um, based on the statistics, uh, uh, statistical analysis. And, and that's why we, we are confident that we're probably the only few regions whereby an SME fintech player can become profitable and sustainably so in, in six, in six or seven years time. And, and that really sets the, the region apart compared to perhaps the fintech credit market in other, in other regions. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I love to see when governments are actually playing alongside with some of the startup ecosystem and some of the fintech players, especially as it relates to regulation. Uh, you mentioned China and China was, a um, you know, a few years ahead in terms of this space, right? Especially in the fintech space, especially in, uh, you know, access to credit to some of the SMEs. So were you involved, or especially in the early days of Funding Society, with those discussions with those regulators? Or um, is that something that you are in relationships, uh, are in discussions with some of those regulators that, you know, they're listening to, they're heeding your advice because you are the market leader? And um, how exactly, and also if you know this, how exactly did, let's say, the Singapore market look to China? Uh, How was that interaction like when they were um, working on the regulation, looking at what China did and trying to make it, uh, you know, take the lessons learned and make it even uh, that much better? I think for we are fortunate that regulators in Southeast Asia has been has been pretty consultative. Um, I wouldn't say that hey they listen to us for advice, um, but I think we are we are very fortunate that we are we are given opportunities to humbly present our ideas based on our own study in the overseas market, and that um, I think how the approach that we have taken is that firstly, I think compared to many other market players whereby. 
in the, 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 the whole fintech credit market probably started in 2013, 2014 in Southeast Asia, first with Singapore, and then eventually in Indonesia in 2016, because we we're the first player there, and then 2017 in Malaysia. Um, the, we, while a lot of pl uh, uh, players take, have taken an approach of let's comply the minimum and let's grow first because with scale, I can get money. With money, I can become the market leader um, and, and, and crush the other competitions and whatnot. We have taken almost the opposite approach, which is, which is that let's comply above what we think the, the regulators will need or will want us to do. And then we gently nudge the regulators to raise the bar so that it creates a, uh, both a barrier to entry, but more importantly, create a more sustainable industry. And that's one example is that even before the market was regulated, so when we first started off the market, there was no regulations. Uh, there wasn't, it wasn't clear. We ourselves, has, we saw how the, the market in China has blew up uh, with the whole um, uh, counterparty risk whereby the whole pl platforms basically take the money and ran away. So we have pr among a few things that we, a few initiatives was that we, proactively work with an escrow agent um, to, to make sure that all funds from both investors will go to a third-party escrow account. Whenever borrowers repay money, they will go to a third-party escrow account. It's not to, to funding society's own bank account or Calvin Teo's uh, holiday fund. No. So, so that, has, that was something that was quite unprecedented in the region. Um, and, that, uh, and, and it was frankly quite hard because we knock on every single door on a, on, in the market in Singapore and no one, only one went uh, one bank and one uh, escrow agent was willing to 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 serve us. Um, it was that 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 nascent. It was that hard during in, in twenty fifteen. Um, but we we're very fortunate that because of some of these gestures, eventually, eventually some of these um, things that we have done or precautions that we have done became law in each of the markets that we're operating in. Uh, in Singapore, perhaps less less driven by our actions because we kind of take the initiative by studying Singapore and UK and US laws and we we proactively comply ahead of time. But I think that. Uh, that action has really helped us to secure license in Singapore, and and that has built, helped us to build credibility. That has that subsequently translated into Indonesia and in Malaysia, and um and another example of how we have uh, of of ideas that we have contributed, and we are very fortunate that regulators have have taken into consideration was to really standardize the definition and disclosure of default rates. Because if without that, everyone is 0% defaults because some of the platforms may take a more creative approach towards defining defaults. Um, we're, so we, that was another piece that we have proactively write out research papers su suggesting these are a few approaches, the pros and cons, and we're very fortunate that regulators were willing to take that into consideration. Of course, they don't listen to us as a, as a player, but uh, but they, they actually do consider it, which we are really appreciative of. And, and because of this whole... Um, balanced approach towards regulations, not just, not, it's not about stringent or loose regulations, it's about reasonableness and suitability of regulations. That's why we have been very fortunate that uh, we are steadily growing and the whole industry is steadily growing within uh, uh, and, and serving the needs of the SMEs. Yeah, that's great. I mean, one thing you had mentioned was the default rate. And um, as with any other business, I, I think it's about educating the consumer. In this case, it'll be on one end, the uh, uh, as far as how good the underwriting is, it'll be for the investor to truly understand how that's being evaluated. And like you said, if there's someone's just calculating it differently and putting up zero percent versus you know uh, one uh, unifiable metric, and then on the other end, uh, how you're actually um, underwriting that for the SMEs. But um, and one thing you had mentioned was what you guys did in Singapore was common law in Malaysia and Indonesia. So that's very interesting. So when you had originally started in Singapore, right? And so when you had gone to Malaysia and Indonesia, how much of the foundation that you had built in Singapore could you actually take into those other two countries? Was there, like, is there generally um, a pretty good relationship with Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore? And did a lot of the foundation structure that you have uh, help you to expand into those other two countries? So I think when it comes to regulators' perspective, I think they, uh, regulators generally do pay attention at what each other is doing. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, hey, they because one player is doing this, that one regulator is doing this, therefore another regulator will do that. Each of them has an independent 
uh, perspective, and and that is nature that is necessary because each of the local market in Southeast Asia is very different, right? So I think whenever we enter a new market, we can basically lev uh, leverage fifty sixty percent of what we have previously built in another market, and the other forty fifty percent we basically have to humbly be a student of the market and re restudy it and then um, redesign it. Um, some of the some of the pieces will be similar, but you can't just copy and paste to to the next market, and that's why. Um, we have we have entered into Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia in 2015, 2016, and 2017 respectively, and then we have taken three last two three years to consolidate each of the operations and the market to become a market leader in each of the country. And frankly, we spend the first year in each of the market just paying school fees to learn about the market because you can't you, it takes time for you to figure out the market. And then in recent times, only starting to look at Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam again. And I think that's so what is a common misunderstanding about Southeast Asia that we find that a lot of say foreign players see Southeast Asia as a single market. It is not true. It is, um, it is, there are approximately 10 plus economic countries in Southeast Asia. I think specifically, I think 11, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But and, and to us, there are six key markets that are critical to us and that each of the market is actually frankly quite different. Um, and I think one advantage for us is really as a regional market leader in that is that hey, we have a proven track record and frankly, they probably did the only player that has a proven track record to be licensed in more than one country to be successful in more than one market because entering into each of the market is not easy and to the extent that we can build a regional platform it actually allows us to collaborate with our foreign players to to receive equity investment from from the other players so and so forth a lot more effectively because for uh for new play from a from a tech player overseas to come to Southeast Asia, they probably don't want to partner with six different platforms in six different economies. They probably want to partner with one player. So, and I think that the besides um besides that, it also I think the scale has also helped us to achieve profitability perhaps a lot faster compared to many other players. So I think Southeast Asia is a much is a fragmented market, um and I think it's very important for any players, be it entr new entrants or existing players, really appreciate that. Um, and to to take that into serious consideration whenever they expand into a new market, a new country in the market, is something that's important. But it's also something that you want to undertake only only until you are very prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And what what's your take on you know as you've expanded now into your total of three countries and you're looking at let's say the Thailand market as well? What's your mindset around either partnering with a current player so that you can skip? that market learning phase versus actually doing it yourself like you guys have and doing that learning period, going through that and having your own team and building that up from scratch uh, via funding societies and not, um, you know, doing a JV with another company. I think in each of the, interestingly, in each of the markets, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, we've almost always partnered with a bank to enter the market. And our take is that because uh, FinTech credit is, it's, a, it's such a complex business, it's such a difficult business. For us, we want to make sure that we maintain control um, over, the, over the entity so that we can, we can ensure that the, the process end-to-end -end is being, is being uh, well managed um, based on our understanding. So, so to us, we, having control is very important because of the risk um, and the complexity of the business. Having said that, we, as we end, even with the experience in the current three markets, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, whenever I enter a new market, we still seek to partner with another local player. While it does not necessarily help us to add to, to, to skip the whole market learning, market exploratory timeframe, but I think it does help to help in terms of future execution and scale up later on. Um, and why it does not reduce the, the whole market learning process is because fundamentally this is a need that has not, that has been underserved or unserved f f historically. So it's not something that, hey, if you reach out to a local player, they will already know. Not really, because they have, even if they're serving the same segment, they have not actually addressed this pain point. Um, and that's why we exist to, to solve this particular pain point, right? Um, so, so to us, we do actively collaborate with local players, and that's the style that we've usually worked with, um, and a more collaborative rather than predatory approach. Um, but, but I think it itself does not actually reduce the need for learning. And to us, whenever we enter a new market, we also hire a local team. Um, uh, so, so in Malaysia, most of our team members are Malaysians. In Indonesia, Indonesians. In Thailand, of course, they'll be mostly Thai, so that it can accelerate some of the process. And uh, but at the same time, keeping a very strong central core, so that for any knowledge transfer, any uh, things that we can leverage as a group, we, we do that, um, so that we can it enjoys the benefit of being a regional player. That's great. And, and 
you mentioned a couple of big names uh, right off the bat when uh, you were introducing funding societies, Sequoia and SoftBank. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about them uh, through your series? I believe it was Series B uh, that they had joined uh, in the investment round and how they've helped you, especially a branded partner like that. How has that helped you and truly expand and um, and help you guys throughout uh, 2020 right now? I think we are, we are very fortunate that um, with, uh, for Series B, SoftBank Ventures led the round. Um, so basically, SoftBank Ventures is a BC arm of uh, SoftBank Vision Fund. Um, they have led the round of Series B in 2018. Um, and in all candor, in quarter one, 2020, we have also raised our Series C, of which we are very fortunate that SoftBank Ventures not just invested in pro rata, they actually went super pro rata in, in the particular, particular round. Um, and that was right before COVID-19. So glad that glad that we managed to raise ahead of time because we knew that um, 2020 would be difficult, but we, of course, did not expect it to be COVID-19 difficult. So so we're very fortunate to have the round uh, raised on time. I think Sequoia, saw, Sequoia came in in 2016 at our Series A. In fact, the funny story is that um, they actually reached out to us um, right after our seed round in 2015. Um, and we were very fortunate that they, to, to get their support to want to invest in us um, and then later on, they found out that my co-founder and I was still in school um, and uh, they wanted to. So basically, the question is that, hey, how much do we should we invest in you to get you to drop out? Um, I said, we have uh, Asian parents. If you drop out, we will, we will probably be killed. So no amount of money will be sufficient. Um, so we're very, very fortunate that um, they've waited. And upon our, our graduation in 2016, so we started the funding societies while my co-founder and I was still in school in the U.S. Um, so, so we were very fortunate upon graduation in, in, in the middle of 2016, uh, Sequoia was still waiting and was willing to invest in us um, upon graduation. So, so very fortunate on that front. I think it, when it comes to navigating, in terms of support, I think they, are, they have been very helpful to provide uh, some advice for, 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 for young founders or for first-time founders um, to, to really shorten our learning curve. So one of the key, key things that Sequoia has suggested, upon approval of investments, they've made they've only made two suggestions, and both of which were counterintuitive to us because upon Sequoia Investing, it's a big brand name, right? Our, we were expecting that, hey, this is your next target, you should grow into that. Um, in 2016, the two things, two advice that Sequoia gave, one was that, tell these boys don't grow too fast. So we, they were referring to us, right, boys. So, which is helpful because we, we wanted to have some adult supervision as well after graduating from school, right? Like, hey, there's a lot for us to learn. Even though we did our, it, we graduated from master's and we have probably, we have quite a few years of working experience, but I think we are still students in startups. So, so firstly, don't grow too fast. For, and for a fintech credit market space, that's very important because everyone is trying to give out loans at times recklessly to grow. For us, we want to take a slow and steady approach, which, it turned out to be correct because we still end up becoming the market leader and overtaking others in a by a pretty big margin. Um, so that's one. Number two was actually to build, to focus on building culture. So since twenty sixteen, we have codified our core values. Um, uh, to 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 really proper to to build a central core of what we believe in and why we are doing what we are doing. Um, and that has helped us to actually uh, build a good foundation for scale up later on. Um, and of course, in recent times, they've also been uh, highly supportive in terms of both funding, introductions, uh, partnerships, so and so forth. So I think for a market like Southeast Asia, whereby, frankly, there aren't that many major funds, having two, two major funds investing, I think is extremely important and helpful towards us scaling up. And it also is reflective towards uh, in Southeast Asia, whereby um, there's a bit of uh, funding gap between, say, Series C or so. When I say Series C, like, I'm referring to um, a round size of between 30 to 50 million US dollars um, because I think 30 to 50 million US dollars is probably a seed round in China, right? But in Southeast Asia, it's a Series C and I think um, their, their presence and support is very helpful because I think for a very young startup market like Southeast Asia, which has kind of started in around 2013 or so, um, there are actually a lot of good VC funds that are investing early stage. So seed round to Series A, B, whereby check size a lead check size is probably around five, ten, five ish, ten ish million USD max. Um, there are some PE funds as well. So KKR, which I was previously from, um, TPG, uh, General Atlantic, so and so forth. You had a PE funds there as well. But I think the venture growth stage, whereby, which is where we are in, whereby we are bigger than venture capital firms, uh, the, the, the investment targets of venture capital firms, but smaller than, uh, where the PE funds will invest. I think that stage is a bit of lacking and having such established funds has also really helped us in terms of over fundraising. Yeah, that's great. I mean, when, um, 
I, I mean, I really love the part that you mentioned about Sequoia uh, saying to not grow too fast. I mean, I, I think I've heard that from multiple people as well. And it, like you said, it does sound counterintuitive, but um, you know, obviously it's worked out. As far as when you guys actually started in 2015, both of you were still in school, like you said, um, in the U.S. How, for your seed round, I mean, did you bootstrap it? Was How did the seed round work? Uh, did you have a network already that you could rely on within the U.S., within you know, your peer network, your professors, or uh, did you win any competitions to get a little bit of initial funding or... Can you take us through the early days and uh, prior to Sequoia jumping in? Sure. I think we were fortunate that when we first, so when we first started out, uh, we actually started out bootstrapping. Um, so I think we, f- uh, in, we first launched in June 2015, but between Feb, but uh, and that's after between, within 100 days of us starting work on, on, the, on the idea. We were very fortunate that my co-founder, Reynaud Wichaya, who was my classmate at, at who is a Chinese Indonesian and, and my classmate at uh, Harvard Business School, he, he was passionate about the idea. He believes, he believes in the vision and he believes that it will really move Southeast Asia and we have a path to be number one. That's why we started a company together. Um, even though his plan to, when he went to Harvard Business School was not to join a startup, was actually to go back to his family business. Um, that's why even though he has an op- he has offer from MIT and Stanford, that's why he chose Harvard Business School because of the family business uh, network there. Um, so we actually started by bootstrapping it, uh, bootstrapping the business, um, but uh, putting together about four hundred thousand US dollars together to to put into the business. Um, but I think over time we have, we realized that the window of opportunity to start the company is small. You either start and scale it during that period of time, or you miss the boat. Um, and our, and and we were fortunate that during our uh, our summer holidays at Harvard Business School, we came back uh, to work for the, on the on a on a business um, in uh, during the summer holidays, and we were very fortunate to win the whole uh, competition called Tech in Asia in Singapore, um, as well as a Maybank fintech program in Malaysia. Um, so as part of the whole, which which is the start of of bank bank type collaborations that we have had. Um, and we were fortunate to have won both competitions that, and that has actually put us noted, uh, which was the first, first PR that we've ever done, um, and got the attention of, um, of a VC fund called Alpha JWC. Um, they were first time fund, but started by, by ex entrepreneurs, um, as well as ex McKinsey folks. And we were very fortunate that, um, they were willing to invest into folks who are still in school, um, and we managed to sign a term sheet before, before the day before we fly back to the to to the to the states for when class starts proper. Of course, when class starts proper, it doesn't mean that we don't do business, we don't work with idea anymore. But rather, we we try to typically work from eight p.m. because Boston is about 12, 13 hours difference. It has a thirteen hour time difference, so we start start working at. 8 p.m., 9 p.m., and work all the way to 3, 4 a.m. to so that we can work in, together with our team in Singapore from a time zone perspective, and then go to class at around 9, 10 a.m. or so. So, um, so we were very fortunate that um, they were uh, Alpha JWC was willing to bet on us and believe in us um, and fund us um, in 2015 while we were still in school. And um, I think on high side, when when we asked them, to, hey, why do you why did, why did you guys invest in us? That's so so very risky. I think. This is something that, that we're really encouraged, right? So two things. One is that I think from an overall macro perspective, typically the whole, hey, the market, the company, the team looks good. Okay, fine, let's invest in. So that's the the, the, the one, one analysis. The other analysis was that, hey, if these guys can actually execute the business so well while they were still in school, what imagine what they can do if they're working on this full time. So so we're really encar- encouraged and grateful for their support. And and um, one thing led to the other. After the after the news of their of, of our GWC's investment, um, Sequoia reached out to us through one of our classmates and then the rest is history. And, oh, wow. So through your classmates. So how has that network helped you over the years? I mean, uh, obviously, one of the most prestigious alumni network uh, being in Harvard. Do you go back to your classmates to talk to? I mean, other fellow founders that have started their own things? Or is it more so your partner in Sequoia and SoftBank that have helped you throughout? Uh, who during this journey have you really relied on the most as far as a mentorship or guidance standpoint? I think interestingly for 
So, hey, uh, Harvard Business School has helped us a lot in, from an education perspective, as well as exposure perspective. In fact, we've, we've, if not because of Harvard, we would not have started the idea, right? Um, we were inspired by the vision to 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 do something that's impactful, vision of, of uh, Harvard Business School to do something that's impactful in a region or in the world. Um, and was ex first exposed to peer-to-peer -peer lending because of education in Harvard, right? Um, and that has given us the opportunity to visit all the major peer-to-peer -peer lenders when we first started off in 2015. Even though we 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 modeled ourselves or we learned key lessons from them, but we did not copy the model because it does not work in the copy and paste when not work in Southeast Asia, and therefore we've constantly evolved from it. But I think. Unfortunately, from an overall ongoing basis, the Harvard network has not been as effective because uh, fundamentally there's still a pretty low interest and understanding of um, of the American startup community or even to an extent the European startup community towards Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, and, and understandably so because there's still a lot of opportunities for growth in, in US when it comes to the tech scene, right? And, and we understand that. Having said that, we do reckon that that, sh that wave will start changing. Um, with, with with the fintech or even tech players paying paying more attention to Southeast Asia, uh, especially given that emerging markets tend to recover from a from a, a pandemic or from a crisis a lot faster than say a typical developed market, and that Southeast Asia is slated to be the f the fourth biggest economy in 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 twenty thirty, uh, after U S Japan China and Germany if I recall correctly, so likely the next growth 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 market of the region. Um, I think a large part of, of our growth has, we have been very fortunate to, to rely on a lot on the McKinsey network as well as the Sequoia SoftBank network for mentorship. Um, the reality is that there's tons for us to learn and that's why when we first started a company, we kind of finish one book every week because there's just so much for us to learn. Uh, but over time, we have been relying on on some of the the, the wisdom of, of the other peers or of uh, peers who have started a company perhaps one, two years ahead of us uh, for advice or for or offer lessons learned um, along the way. So, so it's a small, it's a small community, it's a new community, but it's also a growing community because with that, now we are interestingly among the the most the the oldest or the most experienced founder, having started in twenty fifteen or so. And and I think one big and and that's why we are also working towards contributing back to the community because we we benefited from it and we have been, been mentoring some of us, uh, one or two younger startups as well along the way. That's great. Yeah, that, uh, I mean. Uh... I think that peer network and that uh, that mentorship and guidance definitely can't be undervalued, especially as you guys go through the tough times and even great times. So that's that's great to hear that you had such a great network. Um, you had mentioned that not a lot of uh, Americans or the European market look to other regions uh, to invest in. So hopefully we're trying to change that. So any audience member listening, you know, if they're interested, there's uh, there's definitely significant opportunity. Uh, even outside of your country, um, just outside of um, your region, uh, throughout the world. And so, Kelvin, have you noticed, especially going to school at Harvard in Boston, such a, I mean, that's got such a vibrant startup ecosystem. And obviously, your, your fellow classmates as well are doing great things. What similarities and differences have you seen between, let's say, at a micro level, that Boston market? to the market in Singapore and anything that um, where Singapore is excelling and um, superior to the Boston market or even the greater US market and certain areas where they're actually lacking that you wish to uh, further assist with regulatory uh, with the regulatory aspect or uh, just the greater tech ecosystem. I think perhaps the strength of Singapore and to an extent Southeast Asia is actually regulatory support, right? Um, the, 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 the fact is that the government is extremely, is extremely supportive when it comes to startups, um, be in terms of, uh, for example, funding. Um, when initially there's not many venture capital firms in Southeast Asia, um, or, if, or specifically in Singapore, the Singapore government actually seeded some of these funds themselves. And now, of course, together with some private, other private money, and that has created the initial wave of venture capital funds in the region. Um, and as well as a series of education support trainings, or, or frankly, even job salary subsidy if you're hiring someone who is transiting from at the middle age transiting into the fintech industry. So from over regulatory support perspective, uh, it's really unparalleled. Um, okay, maybe maybe second to UK because I do think that when it comes to fintech regulations perspective, UK is probably among the best and most most supportive. Um, 
So, so I think from a regulations and infrastructure uh, regulations perspective, yeah, they've been actually a very uh, very supportive. Perhaps in Southeast Asia, the two things that are a bit lacking is number one, infrastructure. So there are some digital infrastructure that's not there yet, and it's still work in progress. Example, um, the credit bureau of uh, of Indonesia has only started about two three years back, and frankly, it's still still relatively nascent. So, um, if every time if I search for if I search for which one your name, I can probably find ten people with the same name, and I don't know who which one I should be referring to in the first place. So the credit bureau, is, or or if that may not get you it, get your name. Uh, there may be ten names, but none of them is yours. Um, so, so the so the infrastructure is still relatively uh, nascent, and I think from overall startup culture perspective, it's still frankly quite new. So when we first started off the company, I think um, joining startup that the person may be that the talent pool is relatively limited, and the 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 maturity of the talent pool is also frankly relatively limited. So when uh, when a person comes for an interview, they may be really excited to join a startup, and then after after um, going back to speak to a spouse, and suddenly it's not a good idea anymore <laughs> to join a startup. So um, or of, of course during the COVID period, there is a potential there's a there's a slight trend towards flight to safety, whereby folks who want to work in a more in in a corporate rather than startups. Um, or or they or team or folks may not appreciate what does it mean to work in a startup. Like there's a romanticized view of hey, it means autonomy, it means you can do it whatever you want, so and so forth. But rather, but not a very balanced view in terms of hey, it means that there's a lot lack less clarity. The autonomy autonomy comes with the lack of clarity, which requires you to take initiative to go and figure out rather than just wait for instructions. Or it, it also means that there's less support. A training that you can potentially get compared to a corporate because there's less resources and so forth. So, so it started when initially when it started off, the whole culture and understanding about working in a startup was quite limited. But we're actually grateful that over time it is improving, especially given that the startup scene has gradually is is slowly but certainly uh, steadily maturing. Um, and I do think that that uh, makes creating a makes running a an, uh, we like to think that we have contributed to the overall evolution of the the sector, but we do think that it also creates a fertile land for future future founders to to start a company in Southeast Asia. Oh yeah, I definitely think you guys contributed to to that growth and that effort. So, yeah, I mean that's honestly su such an amazing journey over the years, and I absolutely love. Uh, again, I'm going to say it the the way the Singapore government and the way you're saying that they've adapted and learning best practices and to help um, push this new growth with technology and the startups, uh, especially in the fintech space. So that, that's amazing. And um, Kevin, I, I know we're, uh, you've probably got a crazy busy schedule. So uh, I just want to appreciate you taking your time to talk to us today. Uh, learned a lot, especially throughout your journey with uh, within Southeast Asia and, and especially the regions that you guys are located, your operations and how you guys are truly helping out the SMEs um, um, throughout Southeast Asia. And hopefully next time we talk, you know, you guys will be uh, in more countries and other regions as well. Thanks a lot for having me. Really hope that it's helpful for the audience and uh, really looking forward to our future catch-ups. Thank you so much for listening to the show this week. Please do leave a comment on your thoughts about today's episode and make sure to hit subscribe to get the latest on the Global Ouge. Or if you already have, please share with a friend that you think might enjoy it.